Welcome to the pre-recorded meeting of the Alameda Bible Fellowship. The Bible is the Word of God and should be the daily authority of our lives. Join us as we consider the Word of God, the Bible. Okay, we're ready to begin our hour. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, again we thank thee for this opportunity to talk with thee. Oh, Father, what would we do without thee? And that of the fact that again and again we can come to thee, oh, Father, what a blessing, what a blessing. And to thank thee for all of thy blessings, Yes, they're so innumerable, they're way beyond what we deserve, and uh, at the same time also to beg of thee and beseech of thee that thou wilt guide us, that thou wilt keep us from teaching anything contrary to thy will, that thou wilt guide us in our personal lives, in everything that we do, that we may be under thy our care, not only uh, hypothetically, but in actuality, that thou will care for us moment by moment. Now bless this hour, may it bring praise and glory to thee. O oh, Father, thou art the all-glorious one. We thank thee, thank thee, and praise thee. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. We're looking in, uh, we're finishing up in uh, the Old Testament, uh, in that book that immediately follows Hosea, Amos, and then Obadiah. Obadiah, one chapter. And like we find so frequently when we work in a uh, in a book for a while or in some verses for a while and we just keep learning and learning and learning and uh, you know when we came down to Obadiah a chapter well there's only one chapter where it tells me where we read in verse 15 and for the day of the Lord or the day of Jehovah is near upon all the heathen uh, and so on uh, immediately, it's like a light bulb went out. Uh, went on. I, th this is a big statement because it is telling us that what God is writing here in the book of Obadiah is something right near the end of time where we are because the day of the Lord is judgment day. Judgment day. Well, but when we've been studying Obadiah, it's been talking about Edom. The whole chapter has to do with Edom, and Edom uh, related to Esau, and it was a nation that was uh, located to the south of, uh, of Jerusalem in the desert out uh, b below Beersheba, and, uh, and that's where it existed as a nation, and this language appears to be talking about what was happening back then. And yet it says the day of the Lord in verse 15 is, uh, is near upon all of the heathen. And when we reflect on this, we can, uh, uh, we can develop or can see rather or understand a very, very important principle that we know about. We've already, we've known about it, we've talked about it many, many times, but it hasn't registered nearly as strong as it still must register. What is that principle? Christ spoke in parables. For, now we know that. We can go back to Genesis chapter one, verse one and two where it talks about the first day of creation, and it talks about darkness was on the face of the waters, and, and the, everything was without form and void, and, and we've gone through that a number of times to show that that was actually an outline of God's salvation plan. It was an earthly story that was going on, that God went through these various actions 
on the first day of creation so that they would typify his whole plan of salvation. And then remember, day one, God said, and there, and let there be light. <laughs> and uh, so at the end of the first day, it is anticipating the time when a world that had been plunged into sin, into total chaos because of the rebellion of Adam, it had suddenly uh, been, uh, 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 had suddenly come under the presence of the light of the gospel. Right from day one, right from the very earliest verses of the Bible, God already uh, picked up the idea that Christ spoke in parables. And of course, from time to time, we've gone uh, through various uh, uh, historical events, like when Israel went through the Red Sea, we saw that as a picture of going through, uh, of a believer going through hell. When they crossed the Jordan River, the same way, uh, these were earthly stories. What is the definition of a parable? Any of you children know? Uh, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. But uh, as I was reading Obadiah, again, it really hit me very hard that, you know, the whole fact is the whole Old Testament, the whole Old Testament is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's a parable. No, it doesn't mean that it didn't actually happen. In fact, it is the earthly story. It is the, actually the, the, the very uh, uh, the history of what, what did happen. But it has a heavenly or a spiritual meaning, and it finds its meaning in what's going to happen as soon as Christ demonstrated how he made payment for our sins when he... I uh, rose from the grave on that Sunday morning in uh, 33 AD, and then he poured out the Holy Spirit a few weeks later, and the church age began, and for the next 1955 years, we find the Old Testament reincarnated <laughs> in a spiritual form, if you will. It isn't, it isn't, uh, 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 it, it is a, it is a historical, of course, but the focal point is spiritual, not in, uh, not on the his, not on the. Uh, for example, we don't have, get any details of, of uh, how they constructed their churches or how to build a church, uh, a physical church. Everything is spiritual. How we are to have spiritual overseers, we're to have uh, a membership, we're to offer the ceremonial laws, and so on. It is the, the, uh, the uh, spiritual meaning of the parable that is the Old Testament Israel. Now, that's why when we read about Edom or Ammon or Moab or, or uh, the Canaanites or the, the Philistines or uh, uh, any of those nations of that day, they all have a spiritual dimension. That is a spiritual meaning. And we have found, as we've been going through the book of Obadiah, as well as earlier on, we have found that, that Edom, who uh, where that word comes from uh, Esau, he was uh, the nation of Edom that existed in that day where uh, were descendants of Esau, and Esau was a full brother of Jacob. In fact, he was the firstborn. He was in the direct line of Abraham, and uh, he had uh, all kinds of things going for him as a consequence, and he sold his birthright for a bowl of soup, for a mess of pottage, and uh, and uh, despised his birthright, and so he lost it all. And we learned, uh, kind of backing into it, and now we're going uh, uh, headlong into it, we learned that Edom was a historical parable. He was the earthly story of the side where 
the, he had represented the whole uh, church age as God sent, would send out the gospel into all the world through all the churches and congregations. And then the end of Edom, as he's talking about it coming into judgment, is really focused on the end of the church age, the end of the church age. Incidentally, remember, well, we got into all of this because we were trying to figure out, uh, does the Bible have anything more to say about the, the fact that, uh, that in the year 1990 or 1988, that was the end of the church age and the true believers typified by the two witnesses of Revelation 11 were killed and they lay in the city where the Lord was crucified uh, which was called Sodom and Egypt. That's all parabolic language. It's all earthly, uh, earthly uh, nations and earthly ca characteristics pointing to spiritual things. That's why today, when we're trying to figure out uh, how close to the end we might be, where there's, uh, there is, is, it's valueless, less valueless, <laughs> to look at the nation of Israel over there in Jerusalem or to look at Iraq or to look at the United States or look at China or Russia or anything else because uh, they, that none of that has anything to do with the way God has designed the Bible so that the Old Testament is essentially a historical account or a fact of history, an earthly story that was pointing to a spiritual meaning when God would send the gospel out into the world spiritually. And we don't find any. While in the Old Testament, we find uh, fighting between this nation and that nation, and we find references to this king and that king, and we find references to uh, physical battles of, ki of one kind or another. Go through the New Testament and see how many kings are named uh, uh, that would take would be uh, uh, would be uh, uh, notorious or notable throughout the New Testament era. How many uh, governments are named? Well, virtually none. We we do find just the moral the moral uh, statement that uh, that uh, we are to obey those who rule over us. But beyond that, uh, God doesn't get into any of the physical characteristics of the world the political characteristics or uh, any of that throughout the New Testament, although the Old Testament is dripping with it all again and again. We read about the king of Syria. We read about uh, the king of e the Pharaoh of Egypt. We read, and, and that's because that is the earthly story. And now we have the, uh, the uh, throughout the New Testament, we have the spiritual meaning so that the Old Testament was effectively a tableau, a three-dimensional portrait of uh, God's plan, his spiritual plan, and in the New Testament we see how it worked out. Uh, and uh, just like in the New Testament when he comes to a picture of Christ as the judge, it's a tableau, it's showing him that, uh, that he, we all stand uh, because we're spiritually dead, spiritually dead by nature, we stand all our lifetime before Christ as the judge. But it's a tableau. All right, now let's let's become more specific now and go back to Obadiah. We got down to down to where we read in verse twelve. Uh, but thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother. In the day that he became a stranger, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity, neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape 
neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress, for the day of the Lord, or the day of Jehovah, is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, and shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Now we remember last in our last study, we looked around in the Old Testament, any place we could look, to see how Edom, uh, it's talking here about the land of Edom, how, how did it enter into a, a, in its relationship with Israel? Because this is where the quarrel is going on. It's between Edom and Israel. And we found, uh, oh, we found some tie-ins, but it was very, very minimal, very, very minimal. And uh, we, when it talks about, I should have not stood in the crossway, thou should have not have uh, 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 stood in the, uh, or uh, when it, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity. We can't really find anything in the Old Testament that really ties into that until we recognize this is parabolic language. This is the earthly story. This is the earthly story. God here, and, and, and again, <laughs> as I've been reflecting on this and thinking and praying for wisdom on this, I think how wonderful it is that God, uh, in his, this past year, opened our spiritual eyes so that we saw the whole timeline of history. Because none of this would make any sense at all, any sense at all, if we didn't... Uh, uh, have the, the help of knowing exactly what God's judgment plan is for the end of the world. Uh, I, I, I find again and again in trying to understand this passage or that passage that it, it, if we did not have that information that we knew that the end of the church age was May 21 in 1988 and that was followed by a 23-year period of great tribulation, a period of great testing in which God would begin the judgment on the, on the churches and congregations and, and, uh, and, uh, but also on the world uh, to prepare everything for the judgment day that would follow on May 21, 2011 and go on for 153 days. Now we have all that down like it's in concrete. It's, it's solid, solid, solid. And God has given us plenty of proof so we know that it is absolutely accurate. And uh, once ha we had that, then we could begin to tie that into certain passages to know what the character of those periods of time were. And we found that the Great Tribulation is a time of testing when God is separating the wheat from the tares, going all the way back to Mark 13, God, you can't separate the wheat from the tares until the end of time because you're going to throw out the wheat with the tares if you do it earlier than that. And, and slowly on, we saw all the tests that God raised as, as, as put uh, to the churches uh, as he is separating the wheat from the tares during that period. We saw... We learn, for example, the final ingathering, the final 6,100 days that come just before Judgment Day. And we've gone over this again and again and again. And, and uh, we better be as familiar as possible with all of this because that's where we are. We're, we're right there. We're right in that, uh, right near the end of that, of that time of testing, that great tribulation. We're right near the threshold of the day of judgment. This day that is spoken of in verse 15, the day of the Lord uh, is near upon all the heathen. That is on all the unsaved of the world. That's the day of judgment that is coming. Now, the, uh, the, uh, uh, going back again to this language, thou should have not have stood in the crossway. Uh, thou should have not have looked upon uh, uh, Jacob when, uh, when uh, these dreadful things were happening to them. We have to remember that this is God's evaluation 
of what was happening on beginning and following May 21, 1988. That was the official day when God uh, signed Satan to rule in the churches. That was the official day. And, uh, and uh, that was the day that the true believers began to be thrown out of the churches, excommunicated, or told to leave, or commanded by God to leave. Don't remain in Babylon. Get out. When you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, flee to the mountains. That is, flee to Christ. Uh, and here God is, is telling us how terrible this was. And like I said many times during these last few weeks, when we went through that time, and most, a uh, great many of us were members of churches at that time, and uh, and uh, we didn't sense anything super horrible in the fact that finally we were asked to leave. We, yeah, it was bad. It was uh, uh, we our, sometimes our pride was hurt a little bit, that or or whatever, uh, but we. Uh, we, we didn't carry on like it was a big, big, big deal. But God is saying, never mind. Maybe you didn't sense that. But in my whole plan, this was super, super horrible. When you were asked to leave your congregation, or when I had to tell you to leave your congregation because Satan had was now ruling there. Or when, uh, when uh, uh, you could no longer teach a Sunday school class in your congregation, you could no longer be an elder or a deacon or a pastor. You didn't think that was a, a terrible thing uh, because uh, you didn't know the full Im implication of all of this. But I can tell you from my vantage point, and he's saying it here, as he's pointing to Edom as a picture of the churches that from which we were thrown out of or asked to leave uh, and, and indicated that this was a time of great calamity, as I indicated last time. Notice this language. It's, 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 it's really something because it starts out in verse 17. Thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother, and remember, uh, this is uh, the closest meaning to brother that we can have. It's one thing to be a brother of our fellow man because we're all descendants of Adam, uh, but one is an Indonesian and another one is a Chinese and another one is a, is a, uh, a Russian and so on, and so it's, it, it, it gets, it's a pretty thin line insofar as brother is concerned. But here, God is talking about those who were uh, the seed of Abraham. Abraham, or Jacob, and Esau, Edom, and Israel. And, uh, and uh, therefore, they were very close brethren, just like the wheat in the tares in the churches. We always use that language, and we did it correctly. Sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, they're members of this, we're both members of this congregation. Uh, and uh, this is what it's talking about here, as it's talking about uh, the, the way God has looked upon this event. And these two individuals, or these individuals, you have the church on the one hand uh, who want to continue to follow their creeds, uh, follow their uh, uh, rules by which they govern their congregation or by which they look at the Bible. That's what they're happy with and, and, and don't, talk, don't, don't get in the way of that. If you do, please leave. We, you're a nuisance. Don't sit in that Bible class and keep asking those questions that are embarrassing to our pastor uh, that he can't answer. Just please, uh, you, you, you're making all of us uncomfortable. Get out. 
and uh, this has been experienced again and again and again. And, uh, and, but from God's vantage point, these were brethren, uh, as close to being real brothers as anything could be. And he is saying here in verse 12, but thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother, in the day that he became a stranger, when you asked him to leave, when you excommunicated him, when he had to leave, he became a stranger to you. He was outside. Uh, you were still a part of the congregations that God had very carefully established for 1900 to operate for 1955 years. And you should ne have not rejoiced. And that good feeling that you had when that family left, or that fellow left, uh, who was uh, part of that family, uh, who always uh, made the minister uh, uh, upset because he asked too many questions, uh, and, or, or because he always wanted to uh, 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 teach something that, that uh, proved to be very faithful to the Bible, and yet we, uh, it didn't agree with what our church taught, uh, you were glad to get him out because now we can go our way. We can do what we want to do. We can have our, uh, our uh, 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 plans worked out. We can have the doctrines that we want, and we're not going to get that frustration all the time in the lives of a few people who don't like it. And so God speaks about that, uh, the fact you should never have rejoiced over that. You should have been sad. You should have wept. Oh, boy, this family, uh, it's, it's, a, it, it's a shame. It's a terrible shame that we have to excommunicate them. And, and after they're gone, or this, it's a shame that this family feel that they have to leave because uh, we're not being faithful to the word of God. But that's the way it is. It is a shame. Unfortunately, that's not the reaction that normally was there. I, I know from experience. It was a time of rejoicing uh, over the children of Judah in the day of their distress. Thou neither should have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. In other words, they were in the truth, and you were trying to get in there and tell them you're all wrong, you're dead. Get out, get out. You don't have any part with the true believers. And, uh, and that was a time of their calamity because I established, this is God, God's reaction. I established the, the churches. This was not established by man. They were established by God. It is God who gave the rules for elders and deacons and pastors and membership and all these other things. Uh, and you have, uh, you have destroyed what I have established. It is, a, it, is a, it is a time of destruction. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have had hands on their substance, laid hands on the day of their substance in the day of their calamity. And they, I, I, I still remember, this isn't exactly what God has in mind here, but I, I remember when in 1988, and I, I don't know why God arranged it this way, but it was in 1988 that I was asked not to teach anymore in our church here in, in Alameda. And I had poured a lot of my life into that church. I, it was, it, we had designed it. I had, uh, we had put it all, we had, uh, we worked as a congregation and, uh, and, and built most of it with, with uh, on Saturdays. We, we would be there every Saturday with the, as many people as possible. The women were painting boards and, and bringing a nice lunch, and the men were, were uh, 
were uh, putting it all together and uh, and uh, during the week I had a, co a couple of carpenters there who would lay it all out so that it was all ready for Saturday and and so we built that car that building at a very very uh, low cost very low cost because it was virtually all donated labor and uh, but it uh, we almost wore out the congregation too because this went along for quite a while doing it. And I still remember when, when, uh, when uh, uh, we left because we knew we had to leave. They, they didn't want us there anymore. When we left, I, I had this uh, negative thought just briefly. It didn't bother me a whole lot, but I was thinking, you know, isn't that something? Now, I've poured years and years and years of, of my, my uh, uh, energy and, and so on in helping to build this congregation, not only physically uh, the building, but also con uh, teaching and, and serving as elder and as deacon and as a Sunday school teacher. And, and now, <laughs> out you go <laughs> without anything to show for it. Nothing, nothing. It's like leaving your whole inheritance behind. And uh, uh, this, this, uh, 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 this we did gladly, of course. Uh, gladly, because we <laughs> didn't belong there anymore. But this is, gives you the idea that uh, in the day that, uh, that uh, thou uh, uh, laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. So from God's vantage point, the end of the church age was not a little thing. It was a big, big, big deal, even though we didn't feel like it, feel that at all. And it did indicate the day of judgment is almost here. You notice how everything fits together in this language. The day of judgment, neither, or as it says that uh, in the last part of verse 14, nor, uh, or excuse me, verse 15, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. And the day of the Lord means judgment day is coming on the whole world, on the whole world. Uh, and uh, then it goes on, let's finish these uh, verses now. For as ye have drank, drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen and drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down and they shall be as though they had not been. Drink what? Drink what? What did Christ say in the Garden of Gethsemane? Abba, Father, is it possible that this cup might pass from me? Well, if you have a cup, it's not empty. It's got something in it. And that cup was the wine of God's wrath. The wine of God's wrath. And that is the cup that every unsaved person has to drink. They have to drink the wine of God's wrath. And uh, those who happen to be living at the time that the... Uh, that the, uh, uh, that the uh, Judgment Day begins, they are going to particularly drink of the wine of God's wrath because they got the final word and a clear word. They're getting it more and more clear uh, every day that goes by the fact that God has said May 21, 19, uh, 2011 is Judgment Day. You better listen. You better Listen, and of course, when he, God says that, he also adds that, uh, uh, as we put verses together through the Bible, and yet today is still the day of salvation. You can cry out to God for mercy. How, how loving, how merciful God is that he gives us that information. I, every time these people call on the open forum, uh, and say, oh, no, 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 no. Christ is coming as a thief in the night. We can't know. I keep thinking, what are, you, what are you talking about? Don't you realize? Now, I know why they do it, because 
the fact that you can know uh, the exact date and you're and and you don't want this judgment day to come at all you love this world too much that is that's unthinkable that's unthinkable i don't want to get near that but actually it is the greatest blessing it is a, a mark of the love of god that he's telling us that is the date so now you still got two years you can cry to god for mercy and i'm telling you people i'm telling you that not only you can cry to god for mercy but today God is still saving a great multitude. And so there's a lot of hope for you. But your hope isn't going to come when you, when you mock God or when you disregard this or when you go into uh, uh, denial altogether of this. You're just setting yourself up for that to really be the surprise that it will be for you. And it's not going to go away. It absolutely isn't going to go away. It is going to happen, and so take your pick. You can, uh, you can decide, well, I'll face it when I get there. Well, fine, you will. <laughs> you will face it, and it'll be super, super horrible. Super horrible. <laughs> if you went through the whole Bible, and it would make a list of every ugly passage that God has written anywhere in the Bible, about um, uh, uh, eating your children, or uh, so you, you can go through a passage like, like uh, Deuteronomy 28, where verse after verse is ugly, 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 and look at, write every one of those ugly passages, that's a picture of Judgment Day. That's a picture of Judgment Day. And if you want that, if you want that, if you want to take a chance with that, fine. Fine, go into denial. Don't pay any attention to what the Bible, what God is saying. But then uh, you are, it is going to come. But God in his super love has given us that information so that we can, uh, cry, uh, in our misery, in our recognition of our sins, like the publican, in uh, Luke 18, oh God, have mercy, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. I know I deserve hell. I know I deserve the wrath of God. I know I deserve uh, uh, all the ugly things that you are writing about in the Bible, but oh God, have mercy. And God indicates, yes, Yet it may be that I will bestow mercy upon you. As a matter of fact, let me give you an illustration. That's exactly what the Ninevites did in the book of Jonah. And they, God did have mercy on them. So there's a track record there. God, God may do the same thing in your case. Now, let's see. For as we have drunk on, uh, 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 upon... Uh, my, uh, for as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, in other words, you're drinking, this is talking to the Edomites now, remember, those who remain in the churches, you, uh, you, are, you have a cup that is full of the wrath of God that you're going to be drinking. Uh, 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 so shall all the heathen drink continually. In other words, that same cup of wrath is going to come upon the whole world simultaneously, beginning on that awesome day of May 21, 2011. Yea, they shall drink, they shall swallow down. They're not going to drink it and spit it out. It's going to be, go right down into them, and, and to be, they're totally involved with what they drink, and they shall be as though they had not been. See that language? If you're going to be as though you had not been, it means you're going to be gone. You're going to be annihilated. You are not going to exist anymore. By the time we get to October 21, 2011, there will be nothing, nothing, nothing left that shows that there's ever been a universe or a world or a people uh, down here in, on planet Earth. It's all going to 
be gone. It, as we read in Revelation or in Isaiah 65, it will not be remembered any more. It is though it had not been. Uh, that, uh, that is the final end. Uh, but of course, what this isn't saying is that in the process of you being annihilated, you already have to remember you have lost your potential inheritance of being eternally with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, every time I think about, about that inheritance, we, we think we have it good on this earth. You know, we have a successful career. We live in a nice home. We have beautiful weather most of the time. We have a, a lovely family. We go on and on and on with blessing after blessing after blessing, in the, uh, which is frequently the case. And it is nothing compared with the glory that awaits those who go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, to be in a place where there is no sin, no temptation to sin, no testing to see whether you might sin, no pain, no suffering, no tears. Everything is super perfect. Think of the most uh, wonderful moment that you can think of in your life or you had a little time of 10 minutes or 20 minutes or maybe even a half a day when oh yes, this is the life. I can't believe how happy I am right now. Or just expand that into eternity. Uh, that, that hardly says it. The, uh, because what God ha has for us is Super, super, super glorious. And all of that has been lost by those who are under the wrath of God. That, that potential existed because every human being, I don't care how wicked they were, were created in the image of God. They all started, every one of us started from Adam. Every one of us hopefully had the potential to become saved. Uh, they every single one and you can say well but we really had no control uh we uh, because god chose the ones that he planted to say hey wait a minute that's god's business that's not the way god puts it to us and we have to listen to the way god puts it to us when he tells us wait upon the lord wait upon the lord and he gives an illustration like nineveh where the whole city of 120,000 people became saved because they were waited upon the Lord. That's a pretty encouraging piece of information, isn't it? I would say that it's very, very encour encouraging. And how that all fits into God's plan where he chose, let, let God work out that out. That's his business, that's his business. We don't have to be super wise in our own eyes. We just, we just listen to what the Lord says and follow up what he says. All right, so. But, and then verse 17, but upon Mount Zion shall be delivered. And Mount Zion, that's the kingdom of God. That is where the true believers are. Where is the kingdom of God today? In the churches? No, no, not, not, not at all. Because Christ is not there saving anybody, and, and Satan rules there. Where is the kingdom of God? Outside of the churches, there's an individual in that little house, there's a, an individual over there, there's another one over there, and, there uh, and there's another, there's a king, he's, he's in the kingdom of God. We don't know who they are, but God knows who they are. That is where, that is where the kingdom of God, that is where Zion is, and they are the ones who have been delivered. And there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possession. Well, who's the, their possession? Well, you know, the unsaved of the world, they, what is the one thing mankind wants? What's the biggest thing that virtually every human being wants? Well, you want happiness, you want, but 
But let's tie that down to something solid. What do you want? You want ownership. You want to own your house. You want to own your property. You want to, to say, that is mine. And nobody can take it away from me. It is mine. And who, and, and this earth is, is uh, going to go on forevermore. Not in its present corrupted form, but when it is recreated, a new heaven and a new earth. And who are going to be the owners? Who are going to be the owners? All of the true believers who are co-heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. They will be the owners. And that's what it's talking about here. That uh, there shall be holiness and the house of Jacob, those are all the true believers, shall possess their possessions. They are as if they had never existed. Remember we read in verse 15, as though they had not been. Uh, so there, there's, it, it isn't a matter, now we got a quarrel with somebody, or they're gonna look at us later on and say, hey, you skunk, you took that away from me. I used to own that. No, 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 no. They don't exist, they're gone. They're gone forevermore. Uh, they don't even, they have no, uh, no, there's nothing of them at all. And the house of Jacob, verse 18, shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. And the house of Esau, now that's Edom, that's what the churches are, of Edom for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for Jehovah has spoken it. Where does that fit into place? Now remember, who is the consuming fire? God. Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, oh boy, let's look at it. It wouldn't hurt at all just to read that. Hebrews... Chapter 13, verse 29. This is what God has written. For our God is a consuming fire. Now, that fire will be actual on October 21 when God destroys this whole universe by fire, at least it's, we are, it may be actual, maybe that is simply a figure of speech to show that it'll be totally destroyed because God is a consuming fire. It could be that. We don't know whether it is a literal fire or not for sure, but whenever we see that, that in the here now we find people because they're saying, Mount Zion shall be delivered in reverence, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob, or, or, and, or, or going to verse 18, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire. Well, I, how can that be? Are we going to be spitting out fire? But again and again in the Bible, it, when it talks about the end, it talks about fire in relationship to the believers. And remember this. This is, this is something, again, that we learn only because we've been able to go through the timeline of history. But the, the fact is that as we have learned about the how do I want to say that? As we have learned about the judgment process, the judgment process, what is the nature of judgment? What is the nature of judgment? It is to find a people guilty and to sentence them to death. And to be sentenced to death means to become under the fire of God's wrath. God is a consuming fire. He is a consuming fire. 
And so when we remember in, in, uh, Re in uh, Revelation 11, Revelation 11, we, re we read there about the two witnesses as they were witnessing throughout the church age. And we saw there uh, that uh, we saw there in verse 5, if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded, proceeded out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. If many men will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now, come on. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're, br we're bringing the gospel. Am I spitting out fire? <laughs> well, someone might say, yeah, you sure are. The way you're cutting down the churches and the way you're speaking so ugly about the peoples of the world that they're under the wrath. Well, I'll spit. Uh, it may sound that way, but the fact is that the fire comes because that is the condemnation for sin. As, and it's the word of God that condemns people. When we send, for, when we are bringing the truth of the gospel to anyone, you're talking to your children, you're talking to your husband, you're talking to your wife, you're talking to your neighbor, you're or however it is, if we are bringing the truth, it is the savor of life unto life. It is life-giving for those whom God applies it to their hearts, and it is death unto death. And death has to do with fire and brimstone, just like Sodom and Gomorrah came under fire and brimstone. Now I'll tell you, our, we're, we've run out of time. We're going to pick up right there in our next study and finish Obadiah. And then, as I promised you, from there we're going to shift for a little bit over to Ezekiel chapter 34. Uh, we haven't never looked at that verse by verse, and that will tie right in with the things that we are speaking about here. But now, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, once again, we had an opportunity to look into thy word. Oh, Father, what a joy, what a privilege, particularly as thou dost open our eyes and ears to truth. And oh, Father, we plead with thee, we beg of thee that constantly thou wilt do so. For, Father, how horrible, how terrible it would be if we would be saying, Thus saith the Lord, and the Lord has not said. Oh, Father, oh, Father, have mercy even upon us who are, those of us who are teaching others as we are, as we share the gospel with our friends or family. Oh, Father, may we be faithfully presenting it. Uh, and, and uh, Father, we, we thank thee that as we as we study thy word, it comes more and more open to us so we uh, get a little bit better knowledge each time of what the Bible really is, how beautiful it is, how awesome it is, how wonderful it is, how merciful it is, how loving it is that thou has given us all the world all of this information. Bless us now throughout the rest of this day. In Jesus' name, amen.